Good morning. Welcome. Well, let's stand and sing and worship God together. In my wrestling and in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. In the silence you won't let go. In the questions your truth will hold. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Sing it with me. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness, I will follow you. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, I will trust the promise. You will carry me safe to shore. i 
is our God and all will see how great how great is our God would you pray with me please Heavenly Father you are a great God Thank you, Father, for being you. You love us and give us another chance. You give us purpose in this life. Thank you. Be with us in worship. Hear our words of praise. Prepare us for another day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning from Kid Street as well. A uh, couple things before we uh, get back to worship. Um, on behalf of Christina Fatula and myself, I'd like to thank... Um, Jeannie Snyder and the entire uh, Missions and Actions uh, collections. Uh, our classrooms are fully stocked with supplies. Uh, we may have kids come to school tomorrow uh, without uh, school supplies and we're going to be able to give them what they need to have a successful year because of the generosity of all those that um, you know gave to the cause. So we thank you for that. Uh, as well, According to the bulletin, we have 11 days before Santa Caligon. So the uh, end of the summer is uh, approaching quickly with school and uh, Labor Day weekend. So please sign up in the, uh, the visitor's center for uh, times that you might be able to uh, help park cars or um, maybe uh, donate some uh, food and snacks for the workers. Uh, that type of thing, so it ought to be a good time. Um, so i just like to ask a special prayer on the beginning of the school year here in Independence, uh, so if you'll bow with me. Dear Lord, we, uh, we thank you for uh, your presence in our lives. Uh, help us take uh, you with us as we go to our homes, our neighborhoods, our jobs, our families and, and our schools this week. We ask a special blessing on uh, the teachers and administrators and the children uh, that they um, have a successful uh, and bountiful educational experience this year. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's go ahead and sing together. This is going to be 182 in your red hymnal if you'd like to to follow along in your hymnal. What a friend we have in Jesus All our sins and griefs to bear What a privilege to carry Everything to God in prayer and forfeit Oh, what needless pain we bear All because we do not carry Everything to God in prayer Have we trials and temptations is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrow share? Jesus knows our every weakness take it to the Lord in prayer are we weak and heavy laden cumbered with the load of care precious Savior still our refuge Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy 
friends despise, forsake thee. Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou wilt find a solace there. Father, we just praise your holy name and thank you for all the things that you have given us, all those spiritual gifts that we have. Help us to use those to further your will. And at this time of the service, we bring some of those gifts to you. Guide and direct this church in their use. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This song uh, is very special to me and I know it to a lot of other people. Uh, Michael W. Smith was the first Christian concert that I ever went to. And this was around the time that I was uh, getting saved when I was in high school. And this song was the big song at the end. This was his biggest hit. So uh, it's, it's, and I know that it's special to a lot of others too. So here you go. Here's some Michael W. Smith. Pages waiting to be filled. A heart that's hopeful, a head that's full of dreams. But this becoming is harder than it seems. It feels like I'm looking for a reason. Roaming through the night to find my place. World, my place in this world. Not a lot to lean on. I need your light to help me find my place in this world. My place in this world. If there Down on their knees, a 
among the many can you still hear me hear me asking where do I belong is there a vision that I can call my own show me I'm looking for Bibles with me, if you would. You can see Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, fake news. A couple sermons on this. This one today, you've got to be perfect to have God's help in your life. You know what fake news is? It sounds great, but it's wrong. So, today we're going to talk a little bit about things in the church that are just fake. They sound good. People mean well. People of faith and sometimes of recognition, say things that just aren't true. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Romans chapter 3, keep your passage open if you would. As always, we begin with a time of prayer. So many things deserving of prayer. Our church's ministry and mission, of course, and our issues with the older building and, and what we're going to do in the future with that and our ministries here. So make that a matter of prayer if you would. Pray for our nation in this election year. You know that whole thing there. Pray that we would be given a gift of adulthood. You know what I mean by that? That we can act like adults, everybody, and politicians included. That we would speak respectfully and deal with issues and do so with grace. And help us to be better than we are. You know, we all struggle against temptation to sin on our dark sides and all those kinds of things. For me, sometimes it's just bad habits that I picked up, well, a long time ago. Before I realized they were bad habits, I picked them up. And some of those things come out now and, uh, you know, way later. And so uh, you probably have some of those too. So pray that God can help you with those. I'll give you a few moments of prayer where you're seated. I'll close and we'll look at this passage together. Bow with me, please. Father, we gather this morning to allow you to speak. We give you this time that you might speak to us, influence us, transform us, inspire us, do all those things that you can do to bring us to be in the image of Jesus. We thank you this morning, Father, for this great life. 
we have everything. We are wealthy and fed. We have clothing and everything here. Thank you. We thank you, Father, for family and for your plan for us, for the ways that our lives can be enriched when we follow your plan, for your grace that you give us even when we do not. We thank you for your forgiveness, salvation, hope of eternal life, peace now. Thank you. Father, this morning we come to you knowing that we're a sinful people. We resist you. Sometimes it's out of apathy. We just don't care. We let our emotions and the feelings of the moment turn us away. Forgive us, Father, for our sin, for our apathy, for our resistance to your leadership. Sometimes our not so subtle rebellion against you. Forgive us, Father. We ask for mercy and cleansing and another chance. Help us as we lead this life that we might honor you, that we might resist sin, that we might love, not in word but in deed. We pray, Father, for the willingness to give grace to others, to be gracious and kind and forgiving. As always, we pray for those who have power and authority over us, some elected, some appointed. Guide and direct them. Give them wisdom, self-restraint, a willingness to serve the common good. In this election year, we pray, Father, for the populace, for the general mood of the country, for our economy and all those things. We pray that you could bless us and guide us that we would follow the good light you give us. And we pray that you'd be with those first responders that serve us. Bless them, Father, in their efforts at ministry and making a difference in people's lives. Help them as they work to save people's lives in emergencies and crises. Protect them in their efforts. Help them to see their roles as ordained of God. Thank you, Father, for placing people in our midst that want to serve us. Help us to be servants to others. As always, Father, we love you. We want to follow you, but we are weak in faith. Give us faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, I plan my sermons out months in advance, you know that. And so when I thought I was going to do this thing on fake news, I cringed because I knew it was going to be right in the middle of election season. And fake news is a thing, isn't it? Every day, if you watch the news, you're going to hear fake news or you're going to hear somebody say fake news or something like that. It used to be called yellow journalism. Did you know that? I didn't know that. I've heard the term but never really knew what it was. Yellow journalism and fake news is sort of the same thing. And, uh, you know, interestingly enough, I've, so I downloaded several articles, read quite a bit on the history of fake news in America. Turns out that fake news or yellow journalism is kind of the norm in America. I thought back in the old day that everybody told the truth and there's just something wrong with us now. And George, you're laughing. Turns out that you've never been able to trust most of what you've read in this culture. The truth didn't sell much in colonial times, so they would enhance the truth or they would lie to sell papers and letters and things like that. And that became a tradition of journalism in America. And no one ever cared. It, strangely enough, people knew it. Yellow journalism was a thing and everybody knew you couldn't believe everything you read and people just went with it because it meant at least that the news was interesting. Maybe not true, but interesting. And so people were happy with that. So I was reading an article on this, and it's kind of enlightening to me. He's, and this author says, fake news is as old as journalism. What's new is an interest in the truth. That's new. Who knew that? So fake news is the norm. Being interested in the truth, well, that's a new thing. Kind of interesting, isn't it? Here, here's one statement. The idea of objective journalism only really came about in the early 20th century. So journalists being, 
uh, honest. That's a new thing and not very well practiced and you know that. Um, so it's, it's, but anyway, the author goes on and on and um, several pages down, I'm not going to give you the whole story of course, but interesting, how many of you have ever been on a low fat diet? Yeah. Just cut fat, you'll lose weight. Now, don't raise your hands. How many of you have gained weight on a low-fat diet? Amazingly enough, if you've been on a low-fat diet, you've probably gained weight. So, I wasn't looking for that, but I was just looking under these myriad of articles about fake news and yellow, yellow journalism. And one example was what the, uh, the Sugar Foundation and sugar industry did back in the early 60s. Sugar's kind of a, of a bad deal. You know, that I was taught it was white death and those kinds of things. Well, back in the 60s, there was some research to support that. And some Harvard and Yale researchers did their thing, due diligence, and they came up with a report. Didn't make a lot of news, but it said that sugar was really the problem in America, and that was the problem with the diets. People were beginning to get heavier, and there was a problem that heart problems were beginning to increase in America. And the research said that sugar may be the culprit. So, a gentleman that was uh, in charge of one of the sugar industry giants thought, you know, that's a problem. We need to stop people from figuring this out. So they commissioned some scientists and experts to do some studies. And they produced studies that said, well, maybe not so much. Maybe, maybe sugar isn't the problem. And they had some research done and they didn't and, and it's careful how the author said it. They, they did not falsify evidence. They just purposely misinterpreted it. So their research proved, and I don't want to do the quotation thing, but their research proved that the problem in American diets was fat. So they said, what we need to do is make sure everybody hears this. See if, let's just see if we can bury that sugar thing and lift up the fat thing. So for the next now... 40, 50 years later, we're still hearing that fat is the problem in our diet. If you just cut fat, you'll lose fat and blah, blah, blah. And you and I both know it isn't true, but it's still being out there, isn't it? If you want to lose weight, cut fats. That is a result, not of research, that is a result of fake news from the 60s onward. And to this day, the sugar industry still says that fat in the American diet is the problem, not sugar. In fact, his one wag that was a representative of a candy company said that if kids would eat more candy, they would be healthier and stronger and even happier. My grandkids adhere to that, and uh, so far they're, they're good. And so I, sure, I get them candy all they can, but I know and my daughter knows I shouldn't do that, but I'm grandpa so I can do that. But anyway, a little bit of fake news there. The reason I tell you that is because we have been lied to in a lot of ways. And we, and as a culture, lie to ourselves and lie to others sometimes. It's not always an out-and-out -out lie. Sometimes it's just a subtle distortion. Sometimes a little bit of manipulation. And sometimes it's done so as to make a point about something else. So as Christians, we're to be people of the truth, who want the truth, who want to hear the truth, and want to tell the truth. So that's a problem, isn't it? And we bring what we do in our culture we bring it into church, and you know that. Uh, when there are trends in our culture, ways of thinking and talking and doing things, those trends come into church. And that's always the case. In the passage you're going to read today in Romans chapter 3, this is exactly what was happening. There were cultural trends. Cultural trends in the church that said certain people couldn't be saved. They said God loves the Jews. And they would preach that till they got tired of preaching it. And they were light on this idea of, and others too. So they would preach strong messages of God loving the Jews and Jewish people and people who pronounce the Jewish faith. And they would soft shoe this idea that God loved everybody because they didn't want to hear it. So they mixed truth with the falsehood. And that was a problem. So follow along with me if you would. In Romans chapter 3. I'll read verses 9 through 12 and then 20 through 30. Chapter 3, verse 9. Paul, what then? Are we better than they? Well, not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. 
All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. I'll drop down to verse 28. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since indeed, God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith is one. So you can see that the issue there, remember, Paul wrote in response to a situation. All of Paul's epistles are in response to something already happening. So you can go backwards, read what he says and figure it out. Obviously, there is a Jew and Gentile clash. Jews were what you think of Old Testament related peoples. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all those kinds of people practiced the Jewish faith. Gentiles was everybody else in the world. So for the Jewish mindset, it was very simple. There were two groups of people in the world. There were Jews, and then there was everybody else, Gentiles. And they would say this loudly, God really loved the Jews. Loved them first, gave them a special calling. Everybody else, mm, maybe. And they would do that. And they did that from the pulpit, and it was just so hard. And even when the preachers got it right, and sometimes they did, and even when they, they were taught the correct thing, it was so hard for the, for the Jewish people who had gotten saved, who had grown up as Jews and received Jesus as Savior, it was so hard for them to acknowledge that other people from other cultures, other colors, other music, other foods, other languages, it, it was almost impossible to acknowledge that God loved them as much as us. Can you imagine anyone thinking that way? So the church has always struggled with that. And sometimes the church has failed. Sometimes it comes across pretty subtly. Not always racist, sometimes just dumb. I remember that I told this story before because it was one of those moments in my life where I go, what? And I was a, I was a dumb kid, college kid, in college with 600 other preachers and thought we knew everything because, well, because we just did. And it was that simple. And the preacher said in chapel one day, God cannot use anyone with sin in their life. And we all said, amen. Because, you know, you got to get your sin, your sin out of life. You, you got to get perfect here before God can use you. And God can't use you. And I have preached that. Did for some time. And then one day, I ask myself, wait. If God can't use people with sin in their lives, who's left? Well, nobody. I mean, I would... I could be honest with myself sometimes and I realize that if I, that God couldn't use me because I had sin in my life. doesn't matter what it was. It was there and I knew it. And I started looking at the people that God was using, some missionaries, preachers, and other things. And most of them didn't claim perfection. In fact, is that most of them complained about their sin. And then Paul at one point in Romans said, you know, I... I I can't do the things I want, and I do the things I don't want to do. I can't, I can't seem to get it fixed. And so the preacher had in me said, wait a minute. What that preacher said sounded really good, and I knew what he was trying to do. He was trying to emphasize righteousness and obedience to Scripture. But he went too far, didn't he? That whole hyperbole thing went too far, as hyperbole does. And what he did was distort the truth, because he said one thing, but it simply wasn't true. And that's how fake news starts. A lot of other types of fake news things have gotten into the ears, into the church. And, and sometimes it's simple, it's simple pragmatism. Preachers will say things or we will come to the conclusion that this is the way it is. This is what I like. This is what I'm used to. And we readily dismiss anything else. And if we go to a different church and they don't do things right, or the preacher isn't like the last preacher you had or something, we can't, we can't worship there. And I've, I've had people say that. They go to this church, whatever church it is, and not this one, of course, but, but if they go somewhere else and the preacher doesn't do something just right, well, I just can't worship there. The Spirit isn't working there. And sometimes I knew the preacher and knew he was a pretty good fellow. And, and, and they were interpreting things with a, with a narrow 
a narrow lens. And they were practicing fake news. They didn't say it, but it, it, it seemed as if they would almost say, God isn't working there. See how that works? Well, God's not working there. If I don't like it, God can't use that kind of music. And, and I remember being taught that. My mom hated new music. She was a piano teacher, church musician, started playing worship music when she was 11. It's a long time ago. So the early 30s. And she played music and she was a traditionalist, hardcore. She hated that new music. She wasn't sure God could use it. It took her about 30 years to come around. She ended up finally loving some of it. But still tended to like the old stuff. God can't use that stuff. And see, that's how things creep in. It becomes fake news just based on conviction and belief and comfort. And so my mom was guilty. And she was a great gal. And she wasn't trying to be fake news or anything. See, fake news just kind of creeps into it, doesn't it? It's conviction and emotion and all those things rolled into one without being tested against biblical teaching. Remember the test is always biblical teaching. When you say something, have a conviction, it's okay to hold it, but before you say it, test it. Does the Bible say X? If it doesn't, then you got to be careful. Sometimes fake news tends to divide us. Because there are these kinds of people and those kinds of people. Like in the passage in Romans, Jews and non-Jews. Now the problem with the, the Gentiles in church wasn't that they didn't claim Jesus. They claimed the very same Jesus. They got baptized. They got saved. They made all those commitments. They were tithers and all those things in a church. It's just they had a different background. And because they had a different background, well, they ate different foods. They liked different music. They dressed differently. They were just different. And it was just so much easier to say, well, my people are God's people. And that's what they said. In regards to what the preacher said, people were hanging on to that because old habits die hard, you know. And so Paul had to write, listen. And then he wrote the passage we read. We're all sinners. None righteous. No, not one. So on screen are some ideas of fake news and how, how it can take shape. I don't want to spend too much time here using false teachings or giving false teachings. For instance, uh, you know, churches are good about this, and I hope this doesn't offend you, but it has been on placards, God hates fags. And you know what I mean. You know what I'm talking about, right? And there was a time that it, was, it wasn't, never was acceptable, but it was common to hear that kind of thing. And I was taught things like that growing up and taught things like that in, even in college that there were certain groups that God probably hated them. Nothing could be further from the truth, of course. Number one, you should never use the word fag in reference to homosexuals because it's denigrating and insulting and it's intended to hurt them and separate them. And see, this is one of the key hallmarks of fake news. It separates people. Whenever you do something, say something, believe something, it separates people into groups, good and bad, well, that's a cue, fake news, because the Bible doesn't do that. There are none righteous, no, not one. We're all sinners bound for hell. We're all desperate. See, and so the Bible is the test there, but the church has done that. And sometimes that's extreme, but sometimes you'll hear people talk about homosexuals or different people in a group, and they talk about what pagans they are, what sinners are, and you've got to be careful I understand biblical conviction. But how we think of people personally is, isn't always something that the Bible's talking about. The Bible wants us to love and be gracious towards people. And that's so hard. We focus, I, I use that homosexual issue. In the scriptures, there are at least four or five different passages where Paul or others give a long list of sin. And you've seen those lists. And interesting reading, read them all and see which ones really get you messed up. Because there's always a homosexual issue because we don't know what to do with that. Don't know, can I be nice to them or should I be nice to them? Should I shun them? Blah, blah, blah. And people do that and you know that. But then there's those other sins. Arrogance. Prideful. Gluttons. Oh my gosh. There's that fat sugar thing. And envy. And gossip. 
And all sorts of unrighteousness, people who fight too much, who, who bicker at each other. You see, all those things are there. And we, there's this pesky truth in Scripture, and there's the test, Scripture. Sin is sin. It all separates you from God. So if that be the case, then if somehow you're interpreting a passage that allows you to be disgusted and hate and, and dismiss other people, well, your rationale doesn't pass the test. The test, again, is, is it consistent with biblical teaching? That has to be it. Not how you feel, not what, what some preacher said, but what does the Bible teach? And that's a tough one. Any rule or belief that serves to give you the ability to separate yourself from others has to be rejected because, well, like Paul said, none righteous, not even one. And he's talking to us, isn't he? Another thing, when you promote or tolerate distortions of biblical truth, this is when you hear something that is wrong, it just never occurs you to correct it or stand against it. Well, that's just him. Or you just, you don't care enough to get, or it doesn't involve you. you know, and that's easy to do in our culture. We, we hear a lot of things that are so negative and so critical and so unbiblical. And it really may not affect our circle. So we just don't worry about it. We don't think about it. We don't say anything about it. And maybe we should. And again, you don't need to go looking for a fight, really. But when it comes up, if it does come up, you know, sometimes be willing to say the uncomfortable thing. Well, maybe, maybe we're wrong. I've been, I just finished a book on the year 1927. And that was, that was a big year in our nation's history. Some of you know that. A lot of big things happened. You know, Babe Ruth did his big thing and several other things. And uh, one of the things that was so common is what, the rise of the KKK, Ku Klux Klan. Now, you, you know this. You know what they are and you know what they stood for. Absolute racism, more the hoods. And for some reason in the early 20s, they became wildly popular all the way across America. Not just in the deep south, but in big cities, even in the north. They, they were just kind of the cool kids, which is bizarre because we understand what they are now. But there was a time for about seven or eight years where they were just wildly popular. The craziest thing I read in this story about the KKK, they were so popular that they had Christmas parties for kids. Everybody invited, not really, white kids only. And Santa would wear a hat, not, I mean, the hood. And he would pass out gifts. The backdrop was a burning cross. Now, we say that, find that so offensive, and yet, no one, it, it didn't occur to almost anyone, many Christians, to say there was something wrong with that. It just didn't occur to them. So I don't know if they were blinded by their ideology or their preachers were misleading. I mean, I, I don't understand some of those things. But what happens is Christians can just so, become so complacent or unthinking or they just go with the flow. And the pressures of the day and of the culture tend to sway us where not only do we not test things against Scripture, it never even occurs to us to test things against Scripture. So we have to look at trends in culture and, and how we feel and how we talk and all those kinds of things. And, uh, you know, we do it fast forward decades. You know, sometimes we do it now. I have friends that say, you can't be a Christian and be a Democrat. And then I have friends who say, you can't be a Christian and be a Republican. Or, you can't be a Christian and believe in abortion. You can't be a Christian and believe that people should have guns. And we and tack all those things on it. And all of those are distortions of the truth, aren't they? Strangely enough, Christians can have wrong ideas. Following Jesus doesn't mean everything you believe is correct. And sometimes the Bible doesn't give clear teachings on some things. They give hints and directions. But the Bible doesn't say, thou shalt not have an AR-15 in your house. It just doesn't say that. Fact is, when Jesus and his disciples were prepared to hit the road, they said they had a couple of swords. You know what he said? He did not say, put them down, we're not, we're not going to be armed. He said, that'd be enough. And just dropped it. So, you know, the Bible doesn't always give clear teachings on some issues. So you have to be careful. Fake news is when you draw a line. These people are Christian and these people aren't. The test is the biblical message. What determines who is a Christian? Do they follow Jesus as Savior? 
That's it. People can follow Jesus as Savior and have messed up politics. Yes. I don't like it any more than you do. So what we have to do is be our best, think before we talk, and be careful when you talk. You know, I, I reference Martha Smith. You don't know her. She's dead now. She got her PhD in psychology when she was 65 years old, and she was a hoot. She was hilarious. And it was so hard to have a conversation with her. She had this annoying practice of thinking before she talked. And it was just so hard. You know, in a normal conversation, you talk back and forth, and you say kind of crazy things. And Martha didn't do that. And I'd say something, and she'd... And then she would say something. And, and sometimes it caught me off guard because she had obviously thought through it. And I didn't do that all the time. So, and she would teach me that, you know, you've got to be careful how you say things. So before you speak about those people, and before your convictions divide up people into groups, does it pass the test of Scripture? We're all sinners. Fortunately, God helps us on screen is another idea. We can go to that next grace. God has given the church the truth about his love and grace for all. As I said, fake news in the church always divides. That's the goal. It always labels people. That's the goal of fake news in the church. And, and people don't always call it fake news. They call it convictions. God has told me. God, I feel. I really believe. And those kinds of things. Whenever someone says that, just sharpen your hearing. See what they say. On screen is the real news of the gospel. Follow along as I get read again in verses 9 through 11. What then? Are we better than they? Well, not at all. We've already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin, as it is written, none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands, none who seeks for God. Pretty clear, isn't it? He's quoting Old Testament scripture, of course. And he's saying, listen... For you guys start dividing up into groups and saying these are good and these are bad. Here's the word. And they all knew this. The Jewish people, remember, were the ones that were doing this. And so what did he do? He quoted Jewish scripture to them. Still relevant, guys, he was saying. So there's no special group. Baptists aren't better than Catholics. Catholics aren't better than Methodists. And so on and so forth. All that nonsense that we've always talked about. That was all just... Well, it's just nonsense, fake news. Sometimes Baptists are better than others on some things, once in a while. Sometimes Methodists have got it down. And I hate to admit it, sometimes Catholics got a better grasp of some, some things than we do. And that's the way it is. But no one group is the group. There's no cool kids in the kingdom. And you know what I mean by that, right? Everybody's in the same boat. No special group. Verse 12, look at that if you would. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. Not even one. When you talk to a sinner, remember your sin. Sure changes things. When you remember your sin, when you were ever conscious of where you've been and how you were and what you said just yesterday or this morning, when you do that, then it's really hard to dismiss someone or talk down to them. Because you remember. And that's a good idea. We all struggle against sin. Now, as you get older, I have observed that the grosser sins that are physically manifested don't bother us too much anymore. We're, we're too tired or too old to worry about that. You know, those big things. We're not going to go kill somebody or not going to do drugs probably. It costs too much. All those things. But there's plenty of sins that we can do sitting in our chair, aren't there? Sure. You can just sit there and sin. You don't even have to talk. And there you go. So, acknowledge that. Confess it to God, of course. And carry that with you. I said this yesterday. I thought this this morning. And so when you start talking to people whose lives are a train wreck, remember, you know, I, every... Every morning, I am reminded of my sin as I deal with the daycare families. And a lot of them do have problems. There are a lot of problems with addictions and, and all those kinds of things. And, and their lives are a mess. And it's easy to feel superior. 
until I remember what I said yesterday or what I said this morning or whatever. You know, we're all the same. We all struggle against sin. And that eliminates, if you can keep that conscious, that eliminates this whole arrogant thing and, and us and them. And you, you don't get to do that anymore if you're conscious of your sin. One other thing. Look at verses 27 through 30, if you would. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No, but by a law of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since indeed God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith is one. Everybody's saved the same way. You don't necessarily talk about it the same. I remember one time I was sitting with a group of Presbyterians. Got to watch them presky, pesky Presbyterians. They were from South Korea. And they were in seminary. And they, it was obvious they were Christian. I mean, they, they were Christian. Just like us. They believed the same thing. They were in the same school. Going to go and preach the same gospel. And they were hardcore Jesus people. And they had suffered for their faith. And they didn't talk about Jesus the way I did. They used different terminology and I wanted to correct them. That's how arrogant I was. But I shut my mouth and listened. And over the course of, I got to know them, over the course of years in school together, they, they were the real deal. They just didn't talk like I was. Their culture was very different. That Eastern, that Middle Eastern and Far Eastern culture, they talked different. And I don't even know how to explain it, but you know, we think like Western people. They thought like Eastern people and they talked different. But they were still saved. You know how people get saved? They follow Jesus as Savior. They receive him into their heart. They confess their sins. They allow the Holy Spirit to cleanse them. They make commitments to Jesus. That's how people get saved. That's how everybody gets saved, by the way. They may talk about it different. Sometimes. When you hear people talk, it, 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 it's an epiphany, a, a punctiliar point in time that they just knew right then they were saved. For other people, it, it's different, a little bit more gradual maybe. And I used to think that people couldn't point a time when they got saved that they probably weren't saved. And you know what? I was wrong. I was testing them by a rule that some preacher had taught me. Fake news. That's not what the scriptures say. The scriptures say... You follow Jesus as Savior. That's it. Only Jesus can change all this mess we are. You know, you can use self-discipline to maybe get your mouth under control. And that's a good thing, by the way. Controlling your mouth is a good thing. It's a life skill. So do that. And then, in, in that process, ask Jesus to help you. Jesus, help me to shut my mouth. I do that often. Jesus, help me to shut my mouth. Jesus, help me to avoid stupid. Jesus, help me to keep my mouth shut. You know, over and over and over, because that's one of my weaknesses, my mouth. Which is awkward for a preacher, let me tell you. You know, but you've got to watch that. How you talk represents Christ. So when I talk to daycare mamas about abortion or something, and they do ask me, I, you know, I have all these things in it. This is what I want to say. But I want to reflect Christ. And so that, that mitigates a lot of my passions and convictions and all those kinds of things. Because people look to you for Jesus. On screen is a final passage of scripture. Read this with me if you would. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Wrote it to everybody, Jew and Gentile alike, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Catholic. For the Muslim, that's the choice, isn't it? For everybody, that's the choice. Follow Jesus. Receive him as Savior. Trust him to save you. Base your life on biblical teachings and devotion to Jesus. 
and begin to realize that we're all in this together. This is a big boat, and we all need Jesus the same way. Nate's going to come and lead us in a hymn of invitation. Make decisions. If you'd like to make those decisions public, you can if you come forward. Stand with me, please. in a word of prayer. New grandbaby, so he's happy. He'll tell you about it. Show pictures. Thanks for coming, y'all. See you next week. All right, give me that thing. <laughs> Pray with me. God, we're so grateful for your love for us, and we thank you for the message today, and we just pray that we will take it to heart and look for opportunities to serve you and then act upon those opportunities. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.